Welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast with your host, Emmett Muckles. Please visit iTunes, Stitcher, or EmmettMuckles.com to listen to all the episodes for free. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast. This is your host, Emmett Muckles. Today, my guest is Marcus Ogden. Now, Marcus, I'm going to start it off like this, and you're going to get it. You ready for it? Yes, sir. H U. Bison. <laughs> nice. I haven't said that in a long time, man. A long time. I, I, you know, and, I, and I'm going to confess, I'm not even uh, a Howard graduate, but you know, you know how life is. You know, the, you know where it goes, and you know where it comes from. Um, but one of the things that I was really intent about talking with you about is because you are one of those individuals who has transcend, transcended several circumstances, uh, particularly mm-hmm. after being in the NFL. And if anyone has ever watched 30 for 30, many people know that when someone is in the public eye or in, in the NFL, they make a great deal of money, but oftentimes they end up without a lot of money and resources. But you had the forethought to move beyond that. Can you tell me a little bit about the process that led you to where you are today? Yeah, well, when I got out of the NFL after a six-year career, I started a construction company uh, that grew to be the largest minority construction company in the state of Maryland for two years. I actually did go bankrupt in 2013 on a bad job with a with a, pro, a single project where I trusted the client that took care of me earlier six months prior on another job. And when I did that, I had to kind of sit down and look at myself and say, you know what? At the end of the day, Emmett, it was my fault. I trusted the wrong client, and I shouldn't have not done that. I should have been, had a contract together, dotted my I's and crossed my T's. <laughs> so anyway, after doing that, I rebranded myself, and I decided to turn my negative into a positive. And I wrote a book called Sleepless Nights. Became my bestseller. It's my autobiography. My autobiography became a bestseller in two days on Amazon, and it talks about everything I'm doing from bankruptcy to the NFL to you know everything I've gone through business wise and what I'm doing now a little bit. And now I'm a public speaker, and I travel the country and even internationally talking about business leadership uh, perspective, how to maintain a business, how to be a great successful employee. You know, all those types of things that people actually need motivation, you know, around. I talk about those things in my speeches. Now, you came from a a slightly different household. Um, Your parents were separated or divorced. But correct. The difference was you were raised by your father. What kind of influence do you think that had versus your peers who may have been raised primarily by a female led household? When you have a father who had a degree in economics from Howard University and also got his master's from Maryland University, who worked in finance all his life, who was very successful at an early age and taught his boys about respecting women and education and being a professional, as a young male, I feel that that was imperative for me and my brother to have that because we were big kids. My brother was 6'9 in the eighth grade, and I, and I was like 6'3 when I left high school. So being big young men, you needed that father figure around to kind of tell you right from wrong. That wasn't afraid to kind of look you eye to eye and say, okay, we're not going to go that route. You know, he set for us the precedent of being a professional and doing everything we had to do to be men from an early age. And that's why I'm a husband now and a father. I have the I have the outlook as a male, I'm supposed to take care of my family, be respectful, take care of things for my wife, be a, you know, be that good father figure, husband figure. And really honestly, my opinion, Emmett, that set the tone for me from a young age going forward to who I am today. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So was your household competitive? Oh, absolutely. Now, Jonathan <laughs> is seven years older than me, so wasn't that much from a football standpoint, but when we got out of, you know, uh, I was in college and he was in the NFL, and I, when I got to the NFL, we were competitive. We had a lot of things going on. You know, we were both, you know, rowdy young kids, as far as you know, want to mess around, rough house, things like that, but we were seven years apart, so wasn't too much competition like people would think. 
because of the age difference, but in reality, we were definitely a great uh, household that was competitive as far as you know sports and entertainment, entertainment that we did and stuff like that for sure. Great, great, great. You know, a lot of a lot of athletes or people who are in the public eye, once they remove themselves from what brought them to the public eye, you know, there's these uh, speaking events and uh, appearances that they can make to sustain their life. You did something that was actually out of the norm in the fact that you started your own speakers academy or your speakers bureau. How did that come about? Was it uh, from the result of writing the book and you f- you had a need for your own self that needed to be filled? Great question, Emmett. To be honest with you, about this was pro- almost about a year ago to date right now, I was talking to two friends of mine, both former NFL athletes, and they asked me, Marcus, how are you getting all these speaking jobs? Marcus, how come people are taking you, not just being an athlete, but being you know a serious entrepreneur and a speaker and a motivator? And I told them a lot has to do with my business background, but also as a professional athlete, you have some great traits, leadership, you know, the desire to win, highly motivated, highly prepared. So I took some things I had been working on and I said, you know what, guys? I'm going to put on an academy to help other people, but I've targeted retired athletes and vets to help you become successful. But as I started to do more academies, we're going to our third one. Our first one was in Atlanta. Second one was in Kansas City. The next one's going to be in Baltimore. The public starts saying, well, hey, I want to improve my communication skills as well. I want to learn the art of networking. I want to enhance my brand. Why not? So now – the general public is getting much more wind of our academy, and we have a lot of people that are signing up right now. For example, Emmett, our academy is going to be in November of this year in Baltimore. We just signed up our 18th sponsor to date today, 18th. And we have companies like Home Depot that sponsor our Kansas City Academy looking to come back to Baltimore. New York Life sponsored us from Atlanta to Kansas City to Baltimore. You're talking about some major Fortune 100 brands that have bought into what we're doing because at the end of the day, Emmett, we're creating an atmosphere where people can network and can do business while they're there. I'm not just sitting there talking to you all the time. I'm not talking to you or talking down at you. We're having you know segments. We're having breakout sessions, but we're having networking. There's seven to eight hours of networking built into our program because I believe if my, if my clients – and the tennis aren't networking, they're not growing. And if you're not networking, then you shouldn't even be at our academy because at the end of the day, you'll pick up some great skills, yes, but you should be there to enhance your brand to take it to the next level. Have you ever been or were you ingratiated with uh, Toastmasters International during this time? Or was this something that came natural or were you around a clientele that helped you to build who you are from your speaking standpoint? Uh, to be honest with you, it was natural. And then I, I took speech in college at Howard University. But my grandmother always told me growing up that when I was – where Jonathan and I were, were both football players. My grandparents told me and my father told me, Jonathan will be better at football because he's bigger. He has other attributes that you don't have. You'll still be good, but he'll be better at, at you than football, Ooh. which is actually not, which is not wrong. It's not, I mean, to, be, to, be, to have a Hall of Fame brother, I mean, I'll, I'll take that. But they said off the field, you have great people skills, <clears throat> you are a great communicator, and you speak very well, and you're much more personable than your brother. My parents, I'm sorry, my grandparents and my father told me I'll be more successful off the field. So I kind of had an, 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 an inkling that when I started this business, I remember my grandmother telling me this, so it was just kind of natural. And then what happened was, honestly, I used my football background to get to the door, but I had to kick the door down once I got there. Being a retired athlete, NFL athlete, MLB, doesn't matter. That will get you an interview potentially or get you uh, uh, a meeting with an event planner, yes. But you have to sell yourself once you get there. If you can't speak, you know, coherently, intelligently, fluently, if you can't, you know, be interactive or engaging, you'll never get a job. So sometimes athletes, I feel, believe because they were tired of athletes, they were great athletes on the field, they should be hired for speaking. That's not the case. 
you have to practice, you have to be able to work on your craft daily and expect to be told no. Because honestly, if you're just starting out, you're going to be told no a lot. I was told no, Emmett, for two and a half years before I got my first yes for a paid speaking job. Wow. 30 months I went without one paid speaking job. 30 months. Wow. So when you were going into this foray and you were coming from a business where you were used to people giving you things and I, or, or used to people saying yes, uh, was that a, a, a crushing thing to your ego at the time? Or did you just say this is part of what life really is? This, this is what I tell people all the time. The NFL, MLB, M- NBA, any professional league, for the most part, it's not the real world. Because in the real <laughs> world, people aren't going to carry your past. They're not going to you know, put your shorts in, the, in your locker. That's not how it works. So I knew that already because I got out of the league, I started my construction company and I had my struggles. So I expected that. And I was hoping it would take a lot, a lot less than two and a half years, of course. But I tell guys all the time, if you expect quick results in anything you do, starting a business, you know, becoming a speaker, I don't care what it is, don't even start. Because there is no such thing as quick results. So to answer your question, I knew that was going to be part of my journey, and I was prepared for it. I did other things, Emmett. I worked as a football coach, and I was a graveyard night shift janitor making $8 an hour, working those two jobs combined while I pursued my speaking career. Because I knew I had to feed my family, but I also knew I was not going to be a janitor or a football coach forever. Nothing wrong with those careers, but that wasn't that was not for me. You know, one of the things that many people see when you're in the public eye, whether it be sports, music, entertainment, whatever you have it, they think once you're there, you already have it made. What they don't realize is that you are just regular people. You are just forced into a, a pop public spotlight. Is is there a message that you would have for the public that would say, you know, that you could say, um, we're just like you? We just. Yes. At the end of the day. Athletes, we cry the same, we bleed the same, we're not superhuman. We have just been blessed with some talents that are greater than the normal public. But we have worked our butts off to get where we are. We, Yes, you get fame, you get money, you get all that, but that doesn't really make you who you are. Your character, how you treat people, that's what makes you who you are. That's why, in my opinion, it's important if you're a professional athlete or a superstar or a musician, whoever you are, to treat people with respect because once you're done in the limelight, if you have a great name, it's going to continue on through your legacy. If you treat people like crap, the minute you're done being a professional athlete or in the limelight, everybody's going to forget about you. So it's basically so, the same thing. The people that you see and don't treat well going up the hill, you're going to see those same people when you're on your way back down the oh, hill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly why I moved to Baltimore when I retired. I was always in the community. I was always the guy on Tuesdays going to talk at a school. I was always the guy that would go anywhere the coaching staff or the marketing staff asked me to to do autographs or school readings or uh, a talk. Whatever the staff or marketing or PR department needed to make the team look good in the community, I would do it. I never sat home on Tuesdays on our off day doing nothing. That was never who I was. And by doing that, I was able to transcend from an athlete who retired to a businessman. And that's exactly why I lived in Baltimore, because I had a really good reputation everywhere that I went, of course. But Baltimore was a booming town for construction back in 07, 08, when I retired, 08, 09, when I retired, and that 08 was when I retired. So if I didn't treat people that way, Emmett, when I retired, I'd be another guy <laughs> forgotten that no one cared about that was like, oh, you were an you were one of those asshole athletes that treated people with disrespect <laughs> and you treat people like crap. I mean, that's what you would be left with. And there's a lot of guys in it that get that black ball a lot. 
Now, I want to ask you one thing because I've had to do this myself, and I'm quite a, I'm a few years older than you. Um, I come from Detroit, Michigan, the east side to be particular. <laughs> and there was one thing that I had to understand, that there was two levels of communication in the United States. There's a communication and vernacular with which I was around growing up, and then there's a vernacular to be accepted in the world that you had to adopt. Was that the case mm-hmm. with you, or was it... Uh, was it part of your whole, let me, the, for a better word, swag throughout your life? To be honest with you, I, you always talk different around your homeboys than you do, you know, in the career or public. That's just common knowledge. Mine wasn't too far apart because our father didn't really allow us to go too far off the ledge. <laughs> but again, I'm, you know, I'm from the, you know, we're from the, you know, we're from the ghetto of D.C., you know, we're from, you know, northeast over by, you know, the Minnesota Street Projects, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes away tops. So, yes, I've been and I, when I went to Howard from 98 to 03, that was the hood. I remember standing outside getting some Chinese, you know, carry out that I probably should have been eating at the time. I was already super large on the football team. And I remember hearing a gunshot and I looked to my left. A guy 30 yards away from me had dropped to the ground, got shot in the stomach. Wow. So I've been around everything you could think of from violence to murder to to you know, you know, drug dealers, you name it, seen it all. What I learned is who you are as a person doesn't have to be defined by the way you grew up, one. Number two, you can change who you are to better yourself. For I tell these people all the time, look at Dr. Dre, former NWA, Ice Cube, Easy e that was his crew. Look at him today, this man's soul is coming for over a billion dollars to Apple. Dr. Dre has surrounded himself with people that can take him to the next level financially. He is not the same guy he was 25 years ago. He's rapping on this on the on the corners of LA. That is evolving. That is taking who you are and evolving yourself to be better. You're not really losing yourself. You know who you are. You don't have to show everybody else who you are, where you're from. That's not really important anymore. What's important is how do you carry yourself and how do you carry your brand today? But I used Doc, I told this to Buffalo Bills rookies when I spoke to them last week in Orchard Park, New York. Look at Dr. Dre. He is surrounding himself now with people that are professional that can put money into his pocket. He has lost the street gangster image, and he's doing quite well without it. That's very true. Marcus, I know that your time is very valuable and you have a lot of things on the plate just that's how we have to do in this life. I want to thank you so much. Do you have any parting words for the billionaire lifestyle um, listeners directly from you? I'll say a couple things. Number one, failure is a stepping stone to success. I have an acronym called FAIL. It stands for First Attempt in Learning. If you make a mistake, just own it, move on. Number two, if you own a business... The only way you can be successful and get revenue coming into the door is market, market, market. People say, oh, I've got the best CEO. Oh, I've got the best office. Oh, I've got the best this. I'm like, well, how's your marketing plan? Uh, I don't know. You can't sustain business without marketing. And I'll leave this for entrepreneurs. This last, this is my five, this is my five keys to own a successful business. Number one, know your business. Number two, if you have one, vet your partner. Number three, always vet your employees that you hire. They represent you. Number four, always be properly funded. Number five, if things start to go bad in your business and things start going downward spiral quickly, know when to walk away. So those are the things I will leave you with if you're a business owner or if you're trying to become a billionaire, you're trying to, to, to bring yourself, fail part of life, first attempt at learning, you have to market your business in order to be successful. And number three, again, know your business, bet your partner, bet your employees, always be properly funded, know when to walk away if things get bad, if things start going bad. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been The Billionaire Lifestyle. Marcus, I want to thank you so much. I have a, a little thing that I do at the end. Remember, it is never too late to be in love with yourself. It is never too late to be anew. When you look in the mirror, understand 
you are the billionaire. There's a billion thoughts, there's a billion emotions, and there's a trillion cells. So you are already a billionaire. Go live your life the way you should be doing it. So next time, this is Emmett Muckles. Find the podcast on EmmettMuckles.com, iTunes, and Stitcher. Love you all. Peace.